we were talking, I remember we've had various conversations after church about um, basically misapplications of the regulated principle of worship. And I think this is really important as well, because when I first came across the regulated <laughs> principle of worship, uh, I don't know, even know, should I say the book, but oh, I'll say the book. It, it was Scott Brown, a, a weed in the church. And I remember it made sense to me. You know, there's all this chaos. We need to have regulated according to the word of God. Otherwise, we can do whatever we want. Yes. But there's a problem with that view, isn't there? Yes, there is a problem. There is a problem in that. Oh, sorry. Actually, I should have explained the view because some people mightn't understand what the view is. Basically, not all of life has been included by um, Scott Brown, the National Council of Family Integrated Churches, but a lot of it has, like Sunday school, um, youth ministry, things like that. And that's how the regulative principle tends to be interpreted, that it's not it's kind of loosely applied to a lot of different things but we're saying that this is the regulative principle of worship how we approach god yes yes the regulative principle is a principle of worship the whole of life is to be governed by the moral law the every there's no situation in which we can find ourselves in which the 10 commandments properly understood do not apply but the regulative principle of worship, that is, that we mustn't add, that we need a, a specific warrant for everything we do in worship, that is a principle of worship. Uh, we're to serve God every day, but on the Sabbath day, we are to worship God, and whilst in everyday life, we are free to do whatever the Word of God does not condemn, in worship, we are to do only what God commands and not add our own inventions. And this is a principle of worship. Sometimes it's an attempt is made to say that we need a scriptural warrant for everything that we do in everyday life. This is both impossible and uh, unrequired. Um, sometimes it's applied, for example, to the to the question of the role of women, that if women, if a, if a role for women cannot be found in Scripture, then it it is assumed that she may not do that. But let's apply it to men as well as women. Where are men who were computer uh, programmers, for example, or air aircraft pilots in the Scriptures? They weren't. But these things are perfectly legitimate because they're not condemned. But when it comes to worship, we need positive ordinances from God in order to know how to worship him. And it's, it falls under the sphere of education because I think this is where it impacts the most. Like Sunday school being lumped in with youth, uh, kind of a children's church. And we both, we, we both don't agree with children's church, you know, taking children... Taking children out of the service. Can you just no. explain, what, like, what is the difference? Because it's been... I think it's probably annoyed me a lot over it, just reading a lot of articles. The two have been put in the same, Sunday school and children's church. What's the difference? You know, like, if you're going to... Yeah, well, during the worship service, the children should be present. They're part of the congregation of the Lord. But there is no prohibition... To, uh, as regards instructing children uh, at a, uh, according to their age level and ability in the truth of God. It, it's not some, it didn't begin with Robert Rakes and the Sunday School Movement. It began a long time before that. There are instances of uh, children being taught by other than their parents uh, back to, to the time of the Reformation uh, the time of Knox uh, in Scotland. It happened in Geneva. Um, there was no unified view, and I think that's one thing I've noticed. Though. There, they, did, they had different views, what best way to do it, yes. and often it was dependent on their circumstances, which is right, because, you know, like you were yes. talking one time to me, like about the normative principle as regard to life. Yes, that's right. The normative principle applies to life. The regulative principle applies to the worship of God. And uh, the attempt 
to apply the regulative principle to life is impossible and snags the consciences of uh, sensitive Christians and it weakens the regulative principle when it comes to worship. But uh, How exactly? Just, you know, give an example maybe. Well, because, because it's impossible to apply the regulative principle to life in general, for what what job uh, you, know, you pick uh, or anything like that, or, yeah, because because that is a spiritual ha- decision. What, yeah, you know what decision you make. You know what job you serve in. It could be an immoral job. Yeah. I was in an immoral job when I got saved. I was it was working as a betting shop manager when the Lord saved me. Yeah. So to continue in a gambling shop wouldn't have been right. No, because Scripture condemns that. Yeah. But there are many lawful occupations mm. that aren't specifically mentioned in the Word of God. And they're not wrong because Scripture doesn't positively sanction them. They're wrong if Scripture clearly condemns or or condemns some aspect of them. But uh, so the normative principle applies to life in general. But the attempt to apply the regulative principle, because it fails, it inevitably leads to a stretching of the regulative principle as misapplied to everyday life. And that same flabbiness is then applied to the worship of God. So we want a strict regulative principle as regards worship and not attempt to apply the regulative principle to the whole of life. As far as the instruction of children is concerned, uh, many worthies like... uh, Matthew Henry and Jonathan Edwards have had meetings for young people and children uh, where they taught them the truth of God. The fact is that in the the Reformed tradition, there are various ways, as you've said, of educating children, uh, uh, including uh, educating them in the scriptures and in the knowledge of the truth. The parents are always to be paramount, But uh, at different times and in different situations, whilst there there is general reformed agreement as to the end in view, they do differ as to the practical arrangements and how much other people help Mm -hmm. in the exercise. And And as general principles, I suppose, you can take of how much to get people involved or how much... You know, the parents shouldn't offload too much. That way they're not even bonding with their kids. But there's a general principle rather than, again, the regular principle. Yes, that's right. There's a general principle that the parents have overall responsibility that they shouldn't delegate more than they need to in the sense that they shouldn't become lazy. Mm. And uh, others helping them, it should be in such a way that the parents have to be involved in knowing what's what's going on but there's no prohibition from delegating to other adults to act in loco parentis and teach the children the truth of god it's it's damaging because i knew how my thought process was going through yeah. this i was like thinking well can you have schools yeah. I, I didn't really verbalize it but i was thinking it again can, yeah. can you have schools can you and and after a while, it just kind of started to unravel. I was like, mm, you can't, this, this doesn't really, this, it's not consistent. And there's kind of a, a kind of a movement of homeschool only, you know, no yes. schools, no colleges. Yes. Yes. I kind of, it gets very fragmented. There is Christian liberty, is there? There is Christian liberty. The scriptures require us to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Mm. But we are at liberty to ask others to help. Christian parents can come together. They can employ a teacher. They can form a Christian school. Uh, If you've got to say that each unit has to be separate, um, well... And it it neglects, doesn't it, the the church as being a body. It just treats it as an institution. That's right. And it's like, they treat it like, oh, well, the state is encroaching in us. Well, don't let the the church encroach in us. Like it's some tyrannical, rather than trying to help. Yes, that's right. It um, and uh, if everyone did 
did that, every, if every family was a separate unit, yeah, there would be no, no factories, no. Uh, you know, it would be individual home business or thousands of factories. Small factories. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. how would an aeroplane or a yeah. or even a motor car ever get constructed? Um, because there's the, certain expertise. One, like you know, if we're talking about families, yeah. there's going to be one father. We'll say, if we're going to use the plane analogy, is yeah. an aviation genius, yeah. and you want your kid who's ten years old to maybe learn it early. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, uh, it's a pooling of resources mm -hmm. uh, in the joint enterprise, which really the Protestant reformers did approve of. They didn't approve of everyone having, everyone being completely isolated as a family unit. Strong as they were on the family unit, they didn't say that that uh, Christian parents couldn't join together in the upbringing of their children, or indeed in any other enterprise. There were many under other enterprises where they worked together. So the idea of each uh, family being an isolated unit with the uh, the father self-employed and all the children working for him, whilst it might suit some people, it is not mm. a standard model, one size fits all. And the applications, like just to point out, like in the movement, there's various degrees of how this is applied. There's some people who go off to, you know, like they would go to, you know, father being self-employed and all that, and then all the way to... Well, it, they just apply it to maybe youth ministry or they just apply it to Sunday school and that's yes, it. And it doesn't yeah. go any further than that. Yeah. I suppose what we're trying to work out here is consistency because people, I think the, the people who have started this movement, I think like I think Scott Brown is a godly man. I'm not trying to knock any of these people. I think I think the people who have started are godly, but I think other people have taken it further. And I think that's where it's become incredibly damaging. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes, it does. And, and you know, well, we're always looking for an answer and, you know, the state of the church. Well, there are many evils in the church which need to be put right, but getting rid of Sunday schools will not revive the church. And we're not even saying that you have to have Sunday schools. You can have them if they're useful. No, or, yeah. if they're useful, yeah. then have them in mm -hmm. such a way that parental responsibility is not mm -hmm. neglected. Mm -hmm. uh, but... It, it's a complete, uh, a, a completely wrong to think that getting rid of them will transform the church. It, it'll make very little difference. Mm 